Hello, everybody. Welcome to another webinar of the Media Education Lab. We're happy uh, that you're with us. Uh, today, we have a very uh, exciting uh, webinar uh, to look at uh, gaming and literacy and media and all of that, uh, and looking at the design and the impact on students. Um, and before we start, what I'm asking you is to go to the chat, introduce yourself, where are you from, and from the request of the host, a game that you like. So for me, it's pretty easy. You can see from my background, it would be Lego. Although they do have some online games now that they're trying to do. Um, so again, thank you so much. And I'll head it to uh, Caris Jones. Welcome. We are so glad to have you all here with us today. Um, this session is facilitated by the Literacy Research Association's Critical Gaming Literacy Special Interest Group. Um, and we've been planning this for a while, so we're, we're happy to have it come together. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our facilitator, um, who is then going to introduce our panelists and ask them some questions. Um, and then uh, we will have a uh, breakout room time where we can talk about our specific interests around gaming. Um, so uh, I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Darian Thrailkill, who is a teacher, educator, and researcher who has studied the use of video games in classroom context. As a lifelong gamer, Darian is committed to exploring the affordances and constraints of using games to tell stories in schools. So thank you so much for being here and we're excited to get started. Thank you. Oh, gosh. It's great to see everybody, and I still see some folks popping in. So as you pop in, I hope you get a chance to introduce yourself and possibly send us a, a game that you like to play or something that's maybe your favorite. Today, we have, uh, I'm just trying to get this to share correctly again. There it is. So there we go. Today we have a pretty simple agenda. We're going to just do some introductions and welcoming, followed by the panel, then the breakout rooms. We'll wrap up in those last 10 minutes. For some reason, it does not want to show me my notes, so that's fun. Just give me a moment. All right. This was working a second ago, and then, of course, as soon as we started to actually present, it chose not to. So that's always fun. All right, let me try this again. Let me share my screen. All right, is everyone able to see the screen now? Thumbs up, awesome, thank you, great. Okay, so we have four panelists today, hopefully. I'm not sure that I've seen everybody pop in. Oh wait, now I do, all right, we've got everybody. So we have um, Kenyatta Pretlow, who is a teacher at the ECU Community Lab School with 22 years of teaching experience in the pre-K to fifth grade contexts and Kenyatta really believes in the power of games to increase engagement in the classroom. We're gonna have Sarah Blood, who currently is CTE Agriculture 712 teacher at Schenectady City School. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, when asked about their gaming, they uh, mentioned they game as a family, enjoys board, board games and playing sim type video games. We're also gonna have Nathan Lawrence, who's an English teacher at Commerce High School in Commerce, Georgia who's always thought of themselves as sort of a jack of all trades in terms of gaming, plays PCs, TTRPGs, Switch, board games, generally prefers games with narratives, but also does competitive games. And finally, our last panelist is going to be Peter Wrights, uh, an English 10th to 11th grade teacher at Commerce High School as well. And when asked about their identity as a gamer, mentioned early memories of playing video games, still an avid achievement hunter, even so today, loves playing tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. I, I mean to ask later on if they, uh, if they DM as well. So hopefully we'll get to learn more about them. To start things off though, I'd love it if each of our panelists 
could respond to a question we sent them to prepare some remarks for, which is what are one or two of the favorite ways you've used games in your classrooms? Uh, would anyone like to start us off? Otherwise, I'll just uh, I'll just call on on folks. <sighs> All right, uh, Nathan, would you mind starting us off? Uh, sure. So Peter and I, we teach uh, high school English at a Title I school in rural Georgia, a very small school. And our current focus is on the integration of tabletop role-playing game concepts into the construction of narratives using um, uh, something that's common in tabletop role-playing games called random tables to introduce like sort of controlled randomness into um, students' uh, construction of narratives to lead to better outcomes. And we think also like a sense of play. Uh, I also have, we've been, we've really gotten deep into the concept of like character creation as well in terms of how do we characterize a character in the construction of narratives and also analyzing character in things that we read. Um, I think that in general, tabletop role-playing games as a collaborative storytelling exercise mirror really closely what we want students to do in good creative writing. And I think in some ways in good academic writing. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Sarah, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, so because I'm not a core class teacher, I get a lot of autonomy in my classroom. And I love being able to use games to enhance social and, and emotional growth and also even kind of venture into some of the social justice issues, understanding, especially with economically disadvantaged students, um, how we can go ahead and bring about different rules and policies uh, to be able to overall enhance our environmental awareness. That's fantastic. And then, um, Peter, I don't know if you wanted to respond separately since you and Nathan are doing the same work, but you might have a different uh, concept or some different experiences you'd like to share. Oh, um, well, I, I do use a lot of the same sort of projects uh, that uh, Nathan mentioned. Uh, you know, we're currently doing a thing with The Great Gatsby where they remix elements from throughout, uh, you know, American literary history, but we do it in this way where we've given them a lot of uh, those random tables. And one thing that I add to it that uh, Nathan didn't quite mention is, um, you know, I give kids the opportunity to like really gamify the experience by saying, okay, well, all these things are numbered one through six. So if you let me come by and just roll a bunch of dice for you, and then we kind of put those dice into different boxes and see what kind of story prompt you end up with then, uh, then I'll give you, you know, five points extra credit, which they think is like a crazy huge amount or something. But uh, as soon as they start doing that and they see one kid do it and they're like, oh, that looks fun. I want to try it that way. And then they get into this thing of like comparing the random prompts they got and, oh, my character's going to be great, but they have this big problem they have to overcome or whatever. Uh, and they, by turning it into this thing that they get to play with instead of just an assignment that is, hey, come up with this character, come up with this story all out of nowhere, uh, it ends up turning into something that I think they end up with a lot more ownership over and the, the final result uh, demonstrates that higher degree of care for their product. Fantastic. And then can we also hear from Kenyatta? Good evening, everyone. Um, two of the fa my favorite games or two ways that I've used, I've used uh, several competitive like games to um, increase fluency in multiplication and division and fractions. Um, this year we've used 99 math, which was awesome. The kids love it. Um, another thing that we do, I love board games and so do my students. It just increases our learning community. It teaches them to be competitive, but respectful. Um, and the students really enjoy it. This year, I actually set up a spot in my room that's just designated for um, board games. So, um, I'm looking forward to my new group and seeing if they will be as excited as the other students have been. Excellent. So now I'm going to invite the panelists to respond. Now, as panelists are responding to some other questions, I will take the PowerPoint down so we can see each other a little better. Uh, so the first uh, question, if any of the panel would like to respond, 
in regards to how they think about criticality or power in their game implementations. So, and let me stop the share. There you go. Well, we, uh, Peter and I have actually done some tabletop role-playing game writing together. And in the indie tabletop role-playing game space, there's a, a, there's a lot of tools that people use in terms of consent um, about like X cards and lines and veils. And there's various like sort of tools that we use at the table. And we don't necessarily implement those directly, but I do think we try to have those ideas kind of embedded into our assignments. Like, you know, can, like when you do collaborative role playing, it should be role play by consent. It should be like storytelling by consent, right? And so establishing clear standards of like this, you, you are allowed to say that your story should not go in a way that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, I think is sort of the first step into making a a table of role playing game players, but also a, a classroom comfortable with this kind of work. Do you maybe unpack lines and veils a little bit for folks who might not be as familiar? Yeah. So in um, I Peter can correct me. I think maybe this is an Avery Adler thing from the Powered by the Apocalypse system, but I'm not totally sure who to attribute it to, but uh, it's something that we use a lot where line, uh, a line is like something that is like a hard stop. Like, we're not going to talk about that. This is like a topic on which we're just not going to even touch. And then a veil is something that's like, uh, we're okay with a, a story touching on this, but, you know, it needs to be like a fade to black thing, right? So a veil might be like, well, violence is probably going to be a part of the story, but we don't want anything that's like explicitly violent, you know, whereas a line might be something a, a little bit more... Um, I don't know, impactful to somebody's traumas or that like brings up something really like negative from their past that they just don't want to ever encounter where, and you know, at the tabletop, get at the tabletop, we also do something called the X card, which is like, you know, like if you put your hands in front of your chest in an X, you're saying like, Hey, we're going to like just end this scene and move on. Um, so I think that while we don't implement those tools directly to the kids, I think that one of the one of the lessons we've learned in implementing this stuff into our narratives is that you can't get too caught up on like calling things a game or calling things like Dungeons and Dragons. You just kind of got to use the concepts. Right. And so we don't ever say lines and wheels in front of our kids. But I think we try to establish like we're, we're adding some randomness into the story, but you still have autonomy over the story. Like you, this doesn't have to be like a trauma dump for you. And um, to to add to what Nathan had said there, um, just because I had to check my, just because I had to check myself, it was Ron Edwards who first came up with the line and veils uh, idea for a supplement for um, an RPG sorcery book that he did. Um, but to also comment on the thing about, you know, how much do you tell the kids they're playing a game? Um, I've often found that even if I'm thinking of it up at a game and I can see that they are playing, I don't necessarily say to them, oh, we're going to do this game thing, because then it very quickly for a lot of kids becomes, okay, well, what are the rules? How do I win? Right? What are my optimal <laughs> like ways of playing? And it becomes way less about, you know, the enjoyment of that experience or the product that we're creating together and that kind of thing. So um you know, as just every, every time that I've tried to implement these kinds of things, I found it more useful for my students, at least, to kind of approach it with this attitude of like, hey, we're just going to do something fun. We're going to take this fun approach to doing this. Or I'm going to give you these sorts of scaffolds to help you do this thing. And those scaffolds are basically rules for playing a game, but we don't <laughs> use that language so they don't grow uh, like anxious or competitive over that detail of it. Yeah. And, and I think, and I know uh, Karis can also probably speak to this as much as we can, but like, I think in general, in scholarship, like when you use the words Dungeons and Dragons, like people just have like a whole set of presuppositions and people just don't know what tabletop role playing games are, which is like totally fine. But I mean, the goal, our goal in implementing these strategies is to effectively construct collaborative narratives or whatever our educational goal is, not to have kids learn Dungeons and Dragons, right? And so like sort of making it store brand is uh, helpful. Makes a lot I have, of sense. I have to agree. We don't we don't make it in our classroom a game per se, but we do want 
to have that open dialogue and allow the students to have that autonomy and that criticality over what they're learning and how they're learning it. Uh, so as we're talking about environmental regulations or we're talking about why we have protections to protect our, our natural resources, natural characteristics of some of our students will come out and we'll see that some of them will take that power and um, decide that they're going to go in a negative way. And a lot of our students in the those kind of same tabletop discussions will decide to banish them. They don't like that. So they're using their power as a collective to say, no, we don't like that negative feeling. We're banishing you and that in, into a different area. So we do have to sometimes understand and, and that opens up an even better dialogue into why is that negative? Why are we, um, why don't we want that as a community or as a group and as a whole? And I love that the students are owning that power and they're understanding that it's okay to speak out against something that makes them feel uncomfortable or they don't think is good as a whole for themselves. Just, That's excellent. And I think oh. that really will um, kind of catapult us into our, our next question. And we can still continue the thoughts about criticality throughout this conversation, but adding in that idea about youth engagement and learning that happens when you bring games into the classrooms, maybe adding our thoughts and responses to that question as well, as we continue to think about criticality too. Not to be the one who talks first every time, but that's fine. Um, I do, I think that in general, you know, we often sort of uh, chop up concepts and skills, right? So that they're organized naturally. And I think that a sense of play lets them get to the synthesis skills that we really want them to acquire, right? Like, I don't really care if a kid can do comma splices correctly or use gerunds functionally. Like, I don't care. Like, I care that kids can have meaningful engagements with literature, right? And so I think that gaming is a more, and I hate this word, but it's a more holistic approach to, to like whatever skill you're doing because you're kind of at like games, tabletop games, RPGs, really games of all sorts, engage us on multiple levels, like emotional, intellectual, you know, strategic thinking, creative thinking. And so I think that when you use them appropriately and when you sort of plan them to point towards the goal of what you want your students to be able to do, that you're you're able to hit like a lot of different skills at once with, in a way that doesn't feel like, oh, now we're doing narrative practice or now we're doing grammar practice or whatever. Uh, it sort of um, combines everything, right? You have to be good at storytelling and voice narration and, you know, plot construction, et cetera, to play a good tabletop role-playing game, right? So when you have that in your classroom, you're sort of asking your kids to do all of that at once. Okay, not to be the person that always speaks second, um, <laughs> but it is, <laughs> I <laughs> I love that it's also allowing my students to think critically about problem solving. And I think that's a, a skill set that we don't always allow our students to have. They are so used to always having someone give them the answer or how to work through a problem. The, the games that um, either the tabletop games, the sim games uh, that I introduce in my classroom all allow the students to figure out how to actually solve a problem, either through the design and engineering method, um, or um, that's our, our predominant one is that I, I like to use the design and engineering method so that they understand that they can research and they can work together and they can collaborate to find an answer and that no answer is right or wrong. It's that they have to learn through that process to pro solve a problem.
And I'll also just add on that, like, you, like, in terms of problem solving and engagement, like, you, when you put a goal in front of them, even if you're trying to curb them from being hyper uh, competitive, which we are generally, uh, they still sort of forget the educational context of what you've asked them to do a lot of the time, right? And so you sort of are, like, taking them out of the school mindset. And oftentimes, like as a classroom management strategy, that's very effective because you get less resistance, I think, from students when they don't feel like, sometimes I feel like when we do gaming stuff in the classroom, they feel like that they're cheating. Like, oh, this is just a movie day. We're not learning anything. And it's like, cool, yeah, you got me. Oh no, like you just wrote a story or whatever. Um, and so you're kind of like, there is a little bit of sort of, I think, intellectual judo going on in terms of classroom management as well. I think with that uh, type of thing, kind of thinking about how the engagement factor and the learning factor combine, um, when we do our narrative pieces with this, and they've kind of gone through and you know rolled their dice, built their stories, all this sort of stuff, uh, we also do these same assignments in a round robin format, which I think kind of emulates the play experience as well. So one student might write the you know introduction to their piece through to the inciting incident. And then the next day they pass that off to somebody else and that person picks up the story and kind of works through the rising action up to the turning point, you know? And then on the last day, somebody takes that turning point, fleshes it out and then works through the conclusion. Um, so, you know, they get a good sense of each of those moments in the story and kind of what the elements of a strong plot structure include. But then in terms of engagement, they kind of, uh, you know, interact with that story on a level that they wouldn't necessarily do on their own or with some piece of literature that I handed them, right? Like the kid who picks up the uh, first student's work the next day is like sitting down with them and saying, okay, well, you said that this is their motivation, but I don't really see that happening here. And, you know, we're supposed to get to this thing, but wouldn't it make more sense if blah, blah, blah happened first? Um, and they they get far more into that kind of, you know, sort of meta analysis of plot and character and things like that. And then try to, you know, not just write the story because they want a good grade at that point, but they want to impress their friend that they're putting this together for, or, uh, you know, uh, you treat that person's work with respect and so on, um, which I think too, just kind of shows them more the, the jo actual joy of those creative processes and not just that it's a thing we have to do because, you know, the state standard said we did. Yeah, I mean, and they often restory. Like, if they are all writing stories as a group, they're writing three stories. They have a tendency to put them in like the same universe, or to turn them into fanfic for some whatever shameless fandom that they're obsessed with, right? And I think that in terms of the sort of intersection of criticality and power and engagement, is that like this kind of work I think is inherently about surrendering power in your classroom, and it's about the increase the increase of autonomy for your students. And when you increase their autonomy you're giving them permission to sort of like let their freak flag fly, right? And so you often will be like, oh, well, this is just like a six page My Hero Academia fiction. Oh, okay, this one is too. Oh, okay, now they're kissing. And like, yeah, that is, you know, I could read that on AO3, but at the same time, like they're so invested in this stuff, right? And so like, I think that if you're willing to let go of sort of the didactic control of your classroom, and like sort of live in the fear space a little bit and like maybe let them screw up or write like smut, then, you know, you'll get a better product. Well, and that does kind of get us into the, the last question that we had asked our panelists to be prepared for, which was how gaming has provided new social opportunities in the classroom and, and not just social with each other, but engaging with those social contracts like they will, constructs like they will do when they write in response to their gaming. So if we could spend our last few minutes in the panel portion discussing that aspect, those social learning opportunities, that would be fantastic. Well, I mean, I think that like fundamentally, sorry, I'm, I swear I'm gonna stop. I just have a lot of thoughts. So I think like uh, this sort of like collaborative narr narrative has sort of the same end as many times that fan fiction does, which is like the, the sort of fix it nature of fan fiction, right? Like uh, bringing justice through narrative is like a very common theme we see in these responses. And so sometimes the justice is like, you know, Harry Potter and Draco should have been dating at the end of Harry Potter, 
right? But oftentimes that justice off will also manifest in terms of like retelling or restoring problems that they have in their own lives, whether that's like the injustices they find at their school or that they see in their families or in the community. Like many times we have them some write superhero fiction about halfway through. And many times the superheroes that they construct are fixing the problems that they themselves face, right? And I think that is like a very powerful thing for them. In my classroom, we'll go through kind of the first times we do some of these gaming, uh, gaming ideas and gaming les lessons. Um, I'll let the students kind of pick their own character. They can go ahead and design however they want to. But as we move forward throughout the school year, I'll give them prompts of who, what kind of persona they need to be taking on. Um, and it's helping a lot of our students to, uh, especially our middle school students, to better understand empathy for another type of character or another type of social emotional background that they may not have ever thought about before. So within our middle school hallways, which middle school is a, is a hard enough time anyway, um, they don't even like themselves, let alone being in school most days. So having them kind of sit in another person's seat and have an understanding of where someone else is coming from has really helped to decrease a lot of tensions within our very um, emotional or very diverse school. Um, Schenectady City School District is a 10,000 student school. Uh, we have a number of, well, most recent asylum seekers, English as a new language students, um, immigrants it's a, a huge a hugely diverse school and allowing these students at such a young age be able to understand why people why other students may may think differently or act differently has helped to engage them in better uh, relationships outside of my classroom and even in the hallways All right, so also, since we're about to hop into breakout rooms, I did want to give an opportunity in case there are any burning questions for the panel before we get into breakout rooms to, to please uh, share those. Or if the panel still has some comments, we can use another like two minutes and then we're going to get into our breakout rooms. So to the question about like, has anyone, have we ever done any gaming around environmental justice? Uh, our second like sort of narrative game that we do with them is to like construct a superhero and they get to choose like the injustice that they're facing. And so one of our categories is environmental justice. And we talk about when we're preparing them, like if you select this category, like you're talking about, you know, the depletion of resources or the the sort of like changing of the land that people live on. Uh, but we, I don't think that we've ever really done it like full bore. In my agriculture classroom, we do this quite a bit, um, understanding what are the rules and regulations that are associated with different countries around the world and what allows them to be good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so we have the students will take on uh, different countries and be able to, there's role-playing games associated with different countries and you have to play as if you were associated with those rules and those laws. Um, so it, it can be anywhere from the United States to China to, um, to a number of different African nations um, and being able to understand how those rules, laws and uh, impact not only our environment, but the communities associated with that environment and strategically think forward multiple steps as to how those rules, laws, and policies are going to be impacting our our need, our world as a whole and more than just that little country. Well, I hate I hate to cut this off here, but I'm I'm going to because we really want to make sure we have enough time for the panelists, uh, not for, for the panel, sorry, for the breakout rooms. Um, let me get this back to share just to show you. So we had three main breakout rooms planned, which was considerations for scaffolding games, video games as narrative and gaming and consent. 
Uh, also, any other topic that we feel like has arisen to the surface during the panel, like if folks want to continue that talk about um, the around the environmental aspects and, and considering land use and that sort of thing in gaming, we could make that another um, breakout room if we want to. But I am going to turn that over to those who are able to create the breakout rooms. Um, and, and get us started in those. I will be in video games as narratives myself, but oops, hate when that happens. There we go. Uh, so I will- And um, Darian, I think maybe we'll have um, our breakout room um, facilitators just say um, a few words about their breakout room. So Virginia, do you wanna talk about gaming and consent? I always wanna talk about gaming and consent, Karis. Um, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So um, if anyone is interested to further that discussion about lines, veils, X cards, stop signs, consent flowers, whatever else you want to talk about, or any way that you've thought about those things in your classroom, um, we love enthusiastic ongoing consent in all contexts. So if anyone wants to join me in a space to talk about that, please come to the gaming and consent breakout room. These I'm about to open these in a moment and you'll see the titles of these rooms and you can just self-select right on in. Thank you, Virginia. Um, Hannah, I think, is going to run a room. Hey, guys. Um, so, yeah, my name is Hannah Dietrich, and I'm super excited to run the kind of any topic room. Uh, the goal with that was just to have a space for all of you to be able to participate and interact with each other. Um, if there's something that, like, either sparked your interest, particularly during the panelist discussion today, or if you joined this group because you had a particular question and you were like, I was really hoping they were going to cover this and it hasn't come up yet. Um, and that's a really great space for you to join. Um, hopefully we'll have some other like peers in that that you can kind of like bring those ideas together. Um, and I'd be excited to help you with those things as well. So look forward to seeing some of you in there. And I believe that room is going to be co-hosted with Micah. If you want to introduce yourself real fast. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to co-host that. Hi, everybody. I'm Micah. Um, I, uh, uh, I think there might have been a crosswire somewhere. I can also, um, co-host the, uh, the scaffolding gaming one. I'm happy to talk about, uh, systems, uh, how systems, uh, ro different role-playing game systems, like, create, uh, different storytelling experiences. Uh, if anybody has any general questions about like how role playing games work, um, I'd be happy to answer those too. Um, I also just came back from a three week volunteer stint at a live action role playing uh, camp. So if anybody's curious about that or about what live action role playing is uh, or how it's different from tabletop role playing, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, yeah, here I'll, I'll I'll message you guys in the chat and just figure out uh, what we're doing. But uh, I that am... sounds great. That sounds cool. perfect. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And Thanks, then um, yeah, and then Darian, um, you did you want to say a, a quick sure. thing about your room? Sure. The, certainly, it can take the conversation can take any form it needs to. The idea behind it was looking at what makes narrative within video games separate from narratives in other media, like looking at what it means to be on rails or off, looking at uh, how we construct story collaboratively in video games in particular. I'm also very happy to talk about that in terms of tabletop or any other uh, gaming experience, um, even even unto how we tell stories with our bodies through live action or dance or any of those other uh, opportunities. All right, so Virginia, if you want to open up the rooms, I think people can choose which room they want to be in. Um, so if you click on um, breakout rooms, you should be able to join a room and um, perhaps um, some of our co-hosts can stay in the room and help people if they're having trouble joining one. Yeah, no problem. And if people want to be in a specific room, you can write in the chat and I can put you in that room. If it's too difficult, if you're on a mobile and it's like to find where you should be. So just let me know and I'm happy to assign you um, to a room. So I'll, I'll stay here and all the rest who wants to join, 
feel free to to join any of the four rooms. Okay, hey, seems like people enjoyed uh, their breakout room, so that's good. It's always when people don't want to come back and they're yanked back into the <laughs> room, that's a good sign. That's wonderful. Oh, Karis, I see it's a great conversation. That's great. Um, we wanted to kind of wrap up our conversation at first by asking people if there was anything they wanted to share out from their breakout rooms, any takeaways that are that they're sitting with right now, um, any new ideas that have come to visit. Anything like that. Our facilitators are free to unmute and poke at people who you know had great things to share. We had just sort of gotten started in our uh, discussion, but uh, I think a question that came out um, was just like, what are the um, what are the pain points or what is like most difficult about using games in the classroom? Uh, and uh, the thing that Nathan was starting to say was that um, there is a there's a difference between playing games in the classroom and using game elements in the classroom. And um, I'm not sure that, that that was the point we got uh, yanked back into this room. Um, so I'm not sure where you're gonna get. Sorry, no, it's fine. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know, Nathan. Nathan, if you want to finish that thought, or um, I could try and extrapolate from there. Yeah, no, I just, I was just gonna say, like, I, they're both fine, right? But like, fundamentally, the the it is, I think, two different pursuits. How do you adapt a pre-existing game system into your classroom, right? And how do you use gaming elements to facilitate what you already do? Right, like I work in what I consider to be a pretty high pressure, you know, area of education as like a core teacher in a public school with an EOC, right? So like I, you know, it, it was sort of forced to be somewhat pragmatic about a lot of these decisions and I'm a pragmatic person by nature. And it's not that one's wrong or the other, it's just like, I think you have to be really careful, right? Because games are fun, but like you have to be, always thinking about why you're doing it. We definitely touched on that as well. The need to connect what we're doing very clearly because games are time consuming in wonderful ways, but they're very time consuming. And so making sure you're clearly connecting to skills and strategies and information that they need beyond the game. Which is a question I was going to raise in our group, but didn't get a chance to around like, how do you scaffold specifically around uh, time, right? Because like many gaming sessions, tabletop gaming sessions will run for four hours easily, you know, um, and doing it in a 90 minute, if you're lucky, class period is difficult in a lot of ways. And uh, so how do you sort of make, build whatever narrative you're creating around that, build whatever mechanics or, or systems you're making around that and, and uh, adapt it for the time constraints you have um, is, a, is an open question. But. So building on that, um, we talked about learning objectives um, and, and experience goals, right? So teachers set learning objectives and scaffold around that. Game designers set experience goals, what they want the player to feel and scaffold a rule set or game mechanics around that. And then we could also say for, as you know, critical educators, we could say we maybe have social change goals as well. So I feel like the real art of this is harmonizing those three together. And because this is games are an interactive media, it's very hard to predict whether people will learn, experience, and develop the critical consciousness we want in all those ways ahead of time. Like even the best designer or teacher can't really anticipate that fully. So it feels like it has to be iterative, right? A process of trying something getting feedback, developing a new iteration, getting feedback and honing and scaffolding over time. I'm curious if folks have experiences doing that that they might want to share wisdom around. <laughs> I 
I'm laughing at Micah dancing through that that pause. Um, I think uh, that's a really great question, Matthew, especially thinking about the time scales of scaffolding. There's scaffolding and like you need to learn the, the rules right now. And there's how we think about our semesters and years. And then there's also how we think about a child's experience through schooling and learning outside of school as well across multiple years um, that ideally as they continue to learn from games they play in all aspects of their life, they're carrying some of that learning into and out of our classrooms, um, which is really great. Um, yandy has got a, a thank you in there. And I have a little pitch for you all as well. We're uh, continuing research and inquiry into how folks are um, looking to be supported by research as they're looking to blend their interest in games and gaming and their passion for education. Um, so I've been refreshing my email because we thought we might have our IRB approved by the end of today, it doesn't seem like that happened, but we're going to ask your permission to contact you about participating in a study that would include a survey and potentially a follow-up interview. Um, and if you're willing, perhaps Yanti can share the registration emails with us and we we get that approval, which I bet you anything, it'll be like 6.15 tonight, um, that we can send that on to you. Um, and uh, to learn a little more about what you're thinking after this webinar and and uh, how you're playing with ideas of games and gaming in your classroom. Would that be okay if we could reach out to you with that? Yeah, and also um, to uh, Matthew's question, there's going to be more webinars coming on that topic to answer because it seems like that's a whole webinar by itself, right? Answering your question. So sure. um, since we're at the end of the hour, we want to respect everybody's time and we're happy that you join us. Here in Chicago, it's the hottest day in 74 years. So 110 degrees or something, whatever. I'm in the air condition, so not really. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so much uh, for joining. Uh, thank you for putting in such an amazing uh, panel of speaker, facilitator, and discussion. And uh, please join us for other events. I put the link, and we look forward to seeing you in uh, upcoming uh, webinars.